All hail the power. All hail the power. All hail the power of Jesus' mighty name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. Let's take to our feet as we offer God our heart through worship and through song as we sing hymn number 91, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. The Lord our God, our 
Let us pray. Gracious Father, we marvel at the works of your hands, from the mighty winds to the gorgeous sunsets. All of creation reveals your majesty and the glory of our Creator. Grant us the Holy Spirit's movement that we would glorify you as a people made by you and redeemed through you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive us debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we have the joy of receiving two children of God through baptism into the faith. One is Colton Edwards, a student at, uh, at Southcrest uh, Baptist School. The other is Holly Jessen, who's a student at Texas Tech and our children's pastor. And uh, you'll notice they're wearing white robes today. And uh, as they worship with us this morning, preparing for baptism, all of us are the choir celebrating what God can do with anybody. Uh, from good people to bad people, from smart people to the other kind. Uh, <laughs> God, God can take anybody, but it's critical to realize that whether you're everything or whether you're nothing, ultimately you're nothing without Jesus Christ. God has created this wonderful shelter for in the end when the wrath of God comes, there will also be dancing and salvation and joy for those under the shelter. Imagine a tornado coming through a city. Can you imagine? Have we ever had that? We know those are very real. There will be a global tornado coming. We know not when, but it is coming. 
and anyone that's under the shelter of the blood of Jesus Christ, regardless of who you are, what you've done, who your parents were, what religion you were raised in, anyone under the shelter, anyone connected with Jesus Christ, though he be a sinner, is completely saved and celebrated and treated as if he or she has never once offended the Father. This is what we celebrate today. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for the revelation of your purposes, of your plan, and of your provision. You've given us the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who takest away the sins of the earth. Father, we pray that more than any confidence we have, our ultimate confidence, our boast, would be in Christ, in His cross, and in His perfect prayers over His church. For He is our great high priest, standing and interceding day and night. God, today we especially thank you for the gift of baptism. That through the washing of the waters, you unite any sinner who's willing to submit and repent. That we become married to Jesus for life. Never to lose that salvation, never to be snatched from your hands. And so today, Father, we celebrate for the repentance in Colton and in Holly. And we pray the waters would be blessed as they get married to Jesus. Lord, today we also celebrate fathers. There are multiple stories in the Bible, God, where fathers plead to Jesus, come and heal my daughter. Come and save my son. And there are other stories where fathers bring their children to Jesus and lay him at Jesus' feet. Kids stricken with demonic issues, with issues in their bodies. Fathers pleading to get their kids to Jesus or to get Jesus to their kids. Father, we pray a blessing over every father in this room that their greatest desire would be met. That all of our children would be contacted and encountered by Jesus Christ. Whether He comes to us or we go to Him. We pray, O oh God, that every father in this room, every word of comfort we have spoken to our kids would come true. And that we could celebrate that our children become our brothers and our sisters through Christ. You've given us these children, we pray, and we know this is the greatest entrustment. And we ask this Father's Day for the assurance and the faith of our kids' salvation. Perform a mighty work, O oh God, to seal and to celebrate and assure and confirm the generation we pray for, for our kids. And Father, thank you for loving us so well, giving us prayers to pray, and a name through which we can pray, Jesus Christ. In his name we speak with all power and confidence. Amen.
the 15th chapter of Luke, there's a famous line where the father speaks over his estate. We have reason to celebrate. Slay the fatted calf. Sound the trumpets. Strike up the band. Set the table. For my son was lost, and now he's found. So often we come to this meal and focus on the cost. We remember the cross. We should never forget the cross. We remember the pain. We remember the one, Jesus Christ. But we should also remember that we have reason to celebrate. And God has given us the party. Scriptures teach there is more rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents than when a thousand righteous live their own way. And so today we celebrate with Holly, with Colton, with all the baptized, that through Jesus Christ we celebrate His victory. We celebrate in heaven. Jesus Christ took a loaf of bread, His own body, He says. He blessed it. He broke it. And He said, This is My body, which is given and broken for you. Take and eat, all of you. And whenever you gather and you eat from this bread, do so in remembrance of Me. Let us pray. Our great God, Your promises give us hope. You have agreed to receive us who believe in your Son. Jesus gave his life for us and to us. We live because he lives as conqueror of sin and death. We give thanks for this bread which Jesus chose to call his body. We are grateful that he chose to call all who share this bread his body also. Thank you for reaching out to us through him. Amen. Amen. And in the cup, costly and beneficial, requiring the blood of an innocent, but beneficial for the covering, for the forgiving and the remission of sins, Jesus Christ took this cup and he thanked the Father for it. And then he said, this cup has become for you a new covenant. And it is filled with my covenantal blood for the remission and forgiveness of sins for many people. Take and drink, all of you. And every time that you gather and you share from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Merciful, loving God, just as a father loves and provides for his children, so you have for us. At this table today, sharing this cup, we experience how good and gracious you really are. On the cross, Christ's life was poured out for us, filling us with endurance, character, and hope. As we nurture the fond and loving memories of our fathers, we remember your presence in our lives and give you our eternal gratitude for the gift of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Join me as we remember Jesus through John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We will now receive tithes and offerings. We have no reason to doubt you, Father. We have plenty of reasons to doubt ourselves. This world, our neighbors, but not you. For you bring the rain when you say, and we thank you for tonight's, last night's rain. You bring us peace as we need it, rebuke as we need it, funds and resources as we need them, and we return these back to you, Father as an obedient sign, token of our affection. Lord, we do pray that our life would not be based on giving, however. Rather, our lives would be based on a growing affection and trust in your Son, Jesus, which will produce more giving, I'm sure. 
Father, receive these gifts and use them as a way into our hearts to take us deeper than our feet would wander. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The children are invited forward for Children's Moment. Good morning. So we are continuing learning about confidence today, and we're going to be learning about how we are confident in Christ, that He's going to work in us and through us when we allow Him and we accept Jesus as our Savior. So Emerson's going to tell us what our scripture is. I remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Good job. And Ethan's going to pray for us. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. I hope that we have a great day tomorrow, and I hope that everybody that is sick will be healed. And if they are hurt, I hope that they will be healed. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand for the scripture reading. The scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew 17, verses 14 through 20. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we come to take full advantage of what you invite. You tell us that in Jesus Christ you've become our Father, and a child can go. If her dad is the king, she still has a right to him at 3 o'clock in the morning. The relationship you've given us is one as a child and to his father, and so we speak to you as such, and we thank you, Lord, Father, for all your gifts, and we thank you today for the word you provide. Help us come to terms, we pray, with the privilege that we have in the gospel that you do instill into your church. The gift of faith, the gift of healing, and the gift of miracles. May we not quench the fire. 
May we not ignore your spirit. Instead, Father, may we unfold before you and receive the gifts from heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As we continue on today, we're focusing for three weeks on categories of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in and through the church of Jesus Christ. The word manifest literally means for something that's real, becoming obvious. Like I know the Aggies are the best football team, and you will all know that when we win the national championship next year, which is what I said last year, too, and the year before that. Uh, when something that's true becomes obvious, that's what the word manifest means. And so the faith of the church, given by God, to build a foundation upon, to the foundation upon which we live our lives. Jesus Christ, the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Blessed Trinity, when those things aren't just something buried underground or something stored up for heaven, but are also something we are able to experience today, that's what manifestation means. When something that's real becomes obvious before our, our eyes. Now, the three sets of gifts we're talking about today are referred to as the gifts of power. Last week, we were on the gifts of revelation. Um, I expect to see a little bit of squirming today. That's fine. Y'all understand what my job is, right? It's the Bible. So I'm, I'm glad to do it, and I appreciate a church that's open to hear from the Word of God. Uh, but specifically, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, St. Paul lists nine distinct manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Putting them in categories of three, you've got gifts of revelation, gifts of power, and gifts of inspiration. As we spoke last week, all of these gifts are given to build faith in the church. And so if you've received a gift, you're to use it to your brothers and sisters in Christ so that they are strengthened as you've been strengthened. We also remember that the whole point of spiritual gifts is that these are not natural abilities. You have phenomenal natural abilities. We just heard a phenomenal natural ability on the piano. We hear one on the, the pipe organ every Sunday, the choir. Uh, we hear, we see these things. But a Holy Spirit ability is something that is bigger than your nature. So the ability to see something, the ability to, to watch a healing, to, to participate in a mighty work of God is necessarily going to be beyond what you're naturally able to do. Amen? So that's, what, that's the whole point of these spiritual gifts, and St. Paul teaches on them explicitly in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. Uh, I'm going to read real quickly one verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This is right after he talks about love. Love, love, love. He calls love what, great, what kind of gift? The, the least or the greatest? The greatest gift. So he begins the final chapter on the the manifestation of the Holy Spirit with this word. Therefore, follow the way of love and eagerly pursue spiritual gifts. As we discussed last week, one of the great stirrers and catalysts of spiritual gifts in the body of Jesus Christ is love. It's not knowledge. It's not morals. It's love. And friends, we have a loving church. We have a loving Father. And so today, I want to encourage you once again, as, as I did last week, and I'll warn you next week too, that the missing element for our congregation most likely is, and we're experiencing great things from God, but the limiting factor we have is the second half of verse 1 of chapter 14. Do we or do we not eagerly pursue and desire spiritual gifts? If you're like me, and next week we're going to talk about speaking in tongues, so... Take your Xanax and get here. We'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, if you're like me, you have an, a, a natural fear of losing control. In fact, the, the number one times in my life that I've embarrassed myself, that I'm completely ashamed of myself, the biggest sins I've committed are when I've completely lost self-control. And if you haven't lost self-control, I'm sure you have, but if you haven't, it's, it's very, very uh, frantic and scary. St. Paul is not talking about gifts that God is going to do in you that's going to make you lose control and have shame in your life. St. Paul is talking about God pouring powerful, 
amazing abilities. And this is what's so cool. When God moves in the church of Jesus Christ, it's actually not divisive. It's uniting. So as we walk through the gifts today, the gifts of power, remember these gifts are true, and they actually do become manifest, and they especially become manifest in congregations that are stirred with love, and the individual members are saying, you know, there's part of me that's freaked out by all this stuff, but I believe it. I want it. I want to have an experience with Jesus Christ. I want to have an actual experience uh, where my faith becomes obvious. I want to have a vision. I want to experience a healing. I want to experience something. I want to, as St. Paul says, eagerly desire and pursue the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in my life. There's no shame in that. St. Paul would say there's actually shame in the other side. Saying, I want Jesus, I want the Father, but the Holy Spirit, not for me. What's the only unforgivable sin? Blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, you can actually talk poorly of Jesus. You can blaspheme heaven, but if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, he calls that unforgivable. So let us not. Let us receive. Let us eagerly desire. Let's do the opposite of blaspheme. Let's welcome, because the Holy Spirit is not a thing. He's a person not something we control, it's something we invite into our lives, somebody we receive as we do the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome into our homes, welcome into my heart, welcome into my thoughts. And today we discuss three ways that we see the Holy Spirit manifest himself in power. Power literally means in Greek, uh, the Greek word is dynamus. What does that sound like? Dynamite. It means dynamite. That's where we get our word for dynamite. It's a it's, uh, the power of God does not require the world to sign off on it. When somebody lights a stick of dynamite, I don't, I don't know, do they ask, does the dynamite ask your permission before it goes off? It just goes off. And that's, that's what these gifts are referred to. There's these dynamite gifts, these powerful gifts that are uh, stunning and they're amazing and they actually go against the rhythm of this world. There's a river flowing of death of decay, of blasphemy, of, of hate. A lot of hate going on in our land right now. There's all this flow going on, this river. When Jesus Christ shows up with power through the Holy Spirit, it goes against that and actually turns the tide for a moment for us to see how the kingdom of God works. When Jesus feeds 5,000 people as opposed to turning 5,000 people away. When Jesus heals people as opposed to sending them to a psych ward. When Jesus moves in them and says, I'm not going to leave you till you're better. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having someone fight for you more than you've ever been fought for before? Well, these three gifts, the first one is called the gift of faith. The first gift of dynamite is the gift of faith. Now, you have saving faith, which we all have the moment of us being born again, where you become saved. This is a different kind of faith. It's related to saving faith. It's the faith of being able to be convinced of something. That God has chosen to do something, and you're going to go and witness what God's going to do. The Bible refers to this gift of faith through the patriarch of our religion called Father Abraham. Had many sons. Many sons had, Father, you've heard of him. And daughters. He has many daughters too. Um, but Father Abraham was called the father of faith because he heard from the Lord a vision. He heard a, Lord, a word from the Lord so strong that it caused him to leave his home, change his name. He went from Abram to Abraham. He moved to a foreign country, and God promised Abraham two things that he's still waiting for. God promised Abraham a holy place and a holy people. Out of all the saints, David and Solomon and St. Paul and Peter and Mother Teresa and your mamas and dads and all the saints. Don't you know that the one that's going to be the most psyched about heaven is Abraham? Because Abraham was promised by God a holy city coming down from Jerusalem, a holy Jerusalem coming down from heaven, and that it would be populated with many children born of the promise. Abraham is excited that you're saved because you are the fulfillment of what God promised him 
thousands of years ago, that you would have many children. The gift of faith, as you grow closer to Jesus Christ and he puts something on your heart, it may be God has put in your heart a knowledge that he's going to have you adopt a baby. Or a knowledge that he's going to have you go into the ministry. Or a knowledge that that he's going to have you go and do something phenomenal, something outside of your ability, something outside of your ability to control or even perceive, and you start to lean in and imagine what that would be like. You start to watch God open doors to start maybe a new business or or a new venture, and God opens these doors and uh, maybe a new marriage and brings uh, Wade and Sarah together. It's just God opens these doors and Slowly but surely, you start to notice that God is the one who wants this to happen more than you do. The gift of faith is the gift of living into your future, even though it's not here yet. You see? John is called to missions. The gift of faith is the ability to live forward, not backward. It takes a lot of guts. Amen? to step in and trust the power of the Holy Spirit, to envision a life, a move that's on the horizon, that's coming. Because when God makes a promise, it's not conditional, it's coming. So that's number one, the Holy Spirit gift of faith. And you may have had this experience of God speaking a word into your heart, and you believing in it, trusting in it, and then getting to watch it come to fruition, and you didn't realize how powerful a gift this is. Jesus says, if you have a mustard seed of that, what can that do? It can move mountains. I want to encourage you for a moment to go back and read some of these red letters. If anyone's more excited about the Holy Spirit and power, it's Jesus Christ. We'll skip past the parts for a second where he seems to be upset with us, don't we, right? Like, you have little faith, I'd have to stay with you any longer. But then Jesus says, now if you have the gift of Faith, if you have a mustard seed of faith, you'll be able to say to a mountain, get up and move. And how often do we accommodate subpar conditions in our life? We just accept it for what it is, and we don't believe that God would ever do anything to help us. You see? Jesus speaks to this. And there are people in this room today that God is stirring right now through love and power. He's put a gift of faith in you to do something amazing. I want to encourage you silence all the voices around you and go to the Lord and say, were you serious about that? Did I, did I just eat a bad meal and have food poisoning, have a weird dream last night? Were you serious about that? Because you'll find out his word when he speaks a word. He doesn't quit speaking that until it's fulfilled. The gift of faith is a gift still given by the Holy Spirit today. tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will do so. Nothing will be impossible. The second gift of power is the gift of healing. The gift of healing is consistent through Scripture. And the gift of healing is also one of the ones that really bothers us because we're afraid that if we pray for healing and it doesn't come, then there's something wrong with us. And we're also afraid that if we pray for healing and it comes, what about all the people that didn't get healed? Am I hitting a nerve? The point of the gift of healing, like with all spiritual gifts, is the closer you get to the Father and you hear his heart, and you know what he believes and what he sees and what he thinks, you're not afraid to ask for big gifts. The gift of healing is an actual gift. This congregation has been used by God to pray and experience healing. Do you know this? My first week here, God delivered Lori Wilson from the dead. Do you remember that? Lori Wilson... Pulling the plug, brain dead, done. 72 hours, I'm out in Florida. Of course, that's what you do when you start a job, right? Day one, you go to Florida. So I'm on vacation in Florida my first week here. That's great. 
We get a call, I get a call from Jim Evans 72 hours later, and he said, you wouldn't believe it. He had already met with the family to plan every detail of her funeral because it was only a matter of time. Lori Wilson, 72 hours later, was up walking and talking and eating. How do you explain that? Uh, Mike Chase, who we mentioned last week, experienced a miraculous move in his body. We don't have time to get in every single testimony of every healing we've seen. The point is that God actually does, to this day, produce a power in the church to pray and see healing. And there's three primary ways we see healing. We see physical healing. We pray for Karen Slay's miraculous healing to this day. She's with us today. We see people healed of emotional distress, where God takes you back to a time when you were hurt as a little girl or little boy, and he shows you what he was going through while you were being hurt, and that experience of God's vision over you changes you. You're no longer stuck, licking wounds from the past, God also heals spiritual wounds. He heals problems, deep-seated rebellions against God. You know, many congregations stay in the same place they were at spiritually for 100 years because the gift of healing is not active. The gift of healing is active in this church. People come to me all the time saying, Paul, a year ago I would have never done this, but I repent. That's God healing. Gift number two of the power gifts is the gift of actual healing, and it's something to not be afraid of, but something to claim. And if you notice God is obsessively putting somebody on your heart, to not pray for comfort and for subduing pain and lay down and take it, but to pray for the miraculous power of healing, call him up, go lay a hand on Randall, put a hand on his back and say, God, I, I, want, I, want, I believe that you're going to move in him. I'm going to pray for that. It's number two. Number three is the gift of miracles. Miracles generally have to do with multiplication. We see, um, you may have heard of the stories, you may have had them happen to you where bills are due. We've got stories uh, where we've got people out in Haiti and they're having, uh, they have all these kids coming over the, the hillside, uh, 50, 60, 100 kids that need food, and all this missionaries did was bring food for them. I mean, they're hungry too, so they have a loaf of bread, and they have a couple fixings, and they, they keep reaching into the bag, making food for these kids. We can't turn these kids away hungry. They stop looking at the bag. They just reach and look at the kids, and the bag never runs out. We've seen that. We've seen multiplication happen many times. The gifts of power are probably the most under-asked because they're dynamite. We'll take a, a stirring of the Spirit or joy or peace or something like that, but when healing comes or miracles come or breakthroughs come, literal, powerful, changing of the, the trajectory of someone's life by the interventions of God, he busts in, we are afraid to even consider that God would do that, even though the Bible is pretty much all of that the whole time, over and over and over again. And even the book of Acts, when God calls forth his holy church and it does great gifts to her to go and do the same. But to take the tension, these are two things we need to remember about why God does this and why we should pursue them and not be shy. The first one is God produces miracles in power in the world so that he is worshipped more. You know what happens to your worship life before the Father when you're healed? Do you know what happens? To, it happened to me recently to the worship life of a person when he gives you an extraordinary amount of money and the, you, can't, it didn't, you don't know where it came from? Right when you needed it, he bailed you out. Do you know what happens to a person's prayer life and worship life when literally the biggest problem in their life, the biggest mountain in their life is just melted? And you're like, 
I don't even know what to do with my hands. I built an entire identity around this problem. What do I do now? The first thing to remember is the reason God moves with power still to this day on this earth is for his renown. Not the church's, and not a neat story, but so that we trace the miracle back to the Father. The second reason, and this is really difficult for intellectual people, disciples of Christ, we're probably the most intellectual denomination in the world, Miracles do not speak to the mind, they speak to the heart. And this is the message you'll hear. The world you want is on its way. The world your heart wants, your mind can't comprehend, the world your heart wants where there is no cancer, there are no stillborns, there is no AIDS, there is no children being dealt with at the border. There's, the world that you want is coming. And only a miracle can take you from zero to 90. When you actually recognize and experience something that's true, becoming obvious. This is the point. And the call and the proclamation remains that God still gives these gifts to this day, even in Lubbock, Texas. He gives them to His church. Anyone who has faith in Him that are stirred by love and are pursuing them. Know the way of love and eagerly desire and pursue these gifts, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we do pray that you would overthrow any resistance we have to you. We pray that we would unfold before you and Grow in new ways, and Lord, we pray that as you choose, you would put gifts in us, and all that you would find in us is a desire for you to be manifest. We want you to be obvious. We want the world to see our Father. We want many to come to faith, and we also want the church of Jesus Christ to be united and empowered because the King of glory has moved in her. In the name of Jesus, to all the mustard seeds out there and the healings that will take place by your sovereignty, the breakthroughs and the power, all of the above, we pray with zeal and joy, longing for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we stand to sing our closing hymn, Blessed Assurance. Uh, this is a great opportunity and time. If there's anybody that would like to come forward and join First Christian Church, you'll be received by Jim and Arleno. And uh, we also want to call forward our uh, new, new to be baptized, Holly and Colton. As we make our way to the baptistry, let's let the words of blessed assurance bless the space and prepare the hearts for our baptisms. Let's stand and sing.
You can stand up here. You can stand. Friends, this is Colton Edwards. Go ahead and stand up for me, Colton. You're fine. There you go. Colton is a, a, going to third grade at uh, South Crest School, a Baptist school, and they have been consistently teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and the eagerness to become baptized. Uh, Colton, with a willing heart, uh, came before our church recently and asked uh, if, if we would be the ones to baptize him because he does have undying faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. The scriptures do teach in Acts chapter 2 that when the gospel is preached, uh, the, the most appropriate response is to repent and to be baptized. And I got to sit in my office and watch Colton share his faith of how the Lord warms his heart, how he's, he trusts in Jesus Christ, and he's eager to live a life worthy of that calling. So we are pleased to receive Colton into the church through baptism, and most importantly, into the family of God through baptism. Colton, I'm going to ask you a question first. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and do you profess him as Lord and Savior? Yes. Praise God. Come down here. We're going to turn you around. Oh, hold on. <laughs> He's eager. Colton, upon receiving your confession of faith in Jesus, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Stand right here, buddy. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we know that water does not save a person, but faith in Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us the gift of baptism as an outward sign and symbol, fully moved by the Holy Spirit to repent, and to submit fully. We pray for the power of this baptism for Colton. We pray you break through anything that would keep him from trusting in you. We pray, O oh God, that his marriage to Jesus through these waters would be sweet and beautiful, and that many more would come to faith because of Colton living on this earth. Use this man for your glory. Bless and protect him. And may we all celebrate as the church because there's another brother we have who we'll be spending eternity with in the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Colton. We also welcome Holly Jessen into the waters of baptism. You can choose whether you use the step or not. Good morning. I'm honored to introduce Holly Jessen to you this morning. Most of you know her as our children's pastor, but I've had the privilege of watching her grow and mature in the Lord over the past three and a half years. Uh, when Holly was in her junior year in high school, she attended a summer camp in Athens, Texas, where she met Pastor Paul for the first time. He was a youth pastor there, but had recently been called here to the church and extended an invitation to all juniors and seniors if they were looking for a college to visit Texas Tech and then to come to First Christian Church because they would be welcomed with open arms. However, um, Holly was set on Vanderbilt because she, ever since she could remember, wanted to be a pediatric reconstructive surgeon. As college began to get closer and closer, Holly and her parents began searching. Her mother actually grew up in Lubbock, so there was a natural draw to Texas Tech. Holly and her family visited Tech, and because of Paul's invitation, they also came to First Christian Church that morning. They walked into the coffee shop, and the first family that they met was Jan and Mike Holmes, who welcomed her and her family with open arms. Even though she was just a prospect to Texas Tech, Jan and Mike immediately became involved in her life. She now calls them her Lubbock grandparents. Holly felt a strong draw to this church from the very beginning. The first weekend that she did move here to Lubbock and did choose Texas Tech, she came to this church that Sunday, and I was very lucky to have met her. This was my first month working at the church, so technically she was like my first college student, and she has a very special place in my heart. 
From day one, she felt a strong draw to this church. Her heart, heart felt the love, um, and God began working in her in really big ways. Because of her love for children, she also began volunteering with the children's ministry, helping wherever was needed. If you pay attention to the way God works in people's lives, you can notice his pull on individuals' hearts. God quickly led her into the opportunity to work as our children's pastor for the church. Before she began the job, she joined us on a mission trip to Haiti, which Paul talked about earlier. During this trip, we worked with many children in Haiti. But I do remember one particular moment that I will never forget, and I know Holly won't either. We had gathered in this beautiful old church, praising the Lord with all the Haitian people. As we stood in awe of the way the Haitian people praised the Lord, which is remarkable, by the way, this little orphan boy was right in front of Holly. He turned around, he made eye contact with her, looked at her, and grabbed her hand and held her hand the entire worship service. This brought Holly to tears. This little boy had a cleft palate. He held her hand the entire worship and she was overwhelmed by the sensation of the Lord. She just knew at that moment that the Lord was confirming her desire to become a pediatric reconstructive surgeon. After this trip, she was glowing with the Lord. She couldn't wait to return to school and work for the church. However, the semester turned out taking a real toll on her and she became sick. Something was happening in her life and she didn't know what it was. She didn't realize the void and what it was that God was trying to do. Because of Holly's illness, she was sick over Christmas break and decided when she returned to school that she would only go part-time in order to take better care of herself and rest. She was reluctant to begin her spring semester because her classes were gonna be hard. She was taking organic chemistry. And she was now going to have to graduate later than she expected and hoped. But something beautiful was happening. God began overwhelming that which was overwhelming her. People were being used by God to show Holly what he wanted for her life. As she was sitting in organic chemistry, she got this overwhelming feeling that she was in the wrong place. Now, if I was sitting in organic chemistry, I would too. <laughs> However, this feeling was different. It was both a feeling that brought her fear, but also brought her freedom. Holly's fear was based on feeling like it would be below herself to change her major, I mean, she had been wanting to be a pediatric reconstructive surgeon ever since she was young. However, God was showing her a different way. She began seeing her future from God's perspective and not her own. God wanted Holly to work with children, but to help save their souls, not their appearance. You remember that orphan child in Haiti? The one with the cleft palate? It wasn't the cleft palate that God was showing her, although it got her attention, we do tend to focus on outer appearance. It was in that moment that she saw an orphan child, and a child who embraced her with love by holding her hand. And in that moment, she felt love that she had for this child that she didn't even know. We tend to finish God's sentences. Holly felt the Lord in that moment in Haiti, however, she jumped to her own desires and missed what God was showing her until this moment in organic chemistry. She knew she needed to change her major. She went to try to change her major. It was the last day, and so there was a lot of red tape to go through. However, God is good, and when he is leading, he will make things happen. He used one of the advisors at Tech to get everything handled, and Holly was able to begin her new degree the very next day. She has seen the fruit from this change. She is happier, she's made the president's list, she's healthier, her relationships are better and stronger, and she loves the Lord more than ever before. When the Lord begins working in your life, he empties you of the things that aren't of him, the things of the world, the things of experiences in your past. He begins to fill you with the things from him. In order to be emptied, sacrifices have to be made, and Holly has experienced that. But now she gets to experience what he's doing in her heart. She's experienced forgiveness. Her desires have changed. She's walking by faith. She feels and recognizes the Holy Spirit within her. And she was recently overwhelmed with the sensation to become baptized. She was sprinkled as a child. So today, she is outwardly expressing an inward decision to follow Christ. Today, the only thing Holly knows for certain is that she is a child of God. She is saying yes to Christ, and she is ready to follow Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, 
and do you profess him as Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. Praise God. Turn you. Upon receiving your confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the way you intervene. You even mess up our plans. You derail us to give us a life better than we thought. We thank you, Father, for faith and for the homes we're grown in that practice walking in faith. And we thank you for Jesus, who is prepaid for every conversion that will happen. He's prepaid for every miracle. And he is the one who governs the life of every Christian. Lord, we pray for Holly to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we pray for the church of Jesus Christ, for us all to have wet hair as we leave this place, moved by the Spirit to trust you and live a life worthy of the calling of Jesus Christ, full of trust and joy and power by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please rise? You can stay. You're fine. And receive now our benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his holy countenance and shine his glory upon you and grant you the peace of his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.